Thank you guys very much for tuning in for a very first online live. We're doing a huge barbecue boot camp here in Atlanta at Big Remake headquarters. Everybody is in the middle of the class. Please, you guys, enjoy yourselves. Have, have some lunch, whatever. But this is, this is perfect. You guys have jumped on. Everyone here has been here all day. It's a six hour class. Right now, we're about to prep up some stuff for Tenderloin. We're going to do a spatch coffee chicken. We've got fried bread going down and all kinds of things. We actually did 14 recipes today. So it's been a very busy day, beautiful day. Everyone came out nice and hot, hot line up, right? So it, it's a good time. I think we're going to jump right into it. But before we do that, you guys, what did you think of lunch? <laughs> Bring them up just a little bit. Remember, fat is flavor, so Mel's not looking to get rid of too much of this. They're actually quite lean already. We're just getting rid of that silver skin. Any of that gnarly stuff. It doesn't look fantastic to you now. It's not going to look fantastic when it's done either, so that's what we're doing. We're getting rid of it. And now we're going to butterfly it out. These are quite small, so we're going to be very gentle with our, with our cuts here. Open our flap up. Bring it around. Just like that. Now we're going to cover it. Get a meat tenderizer going. We're going to flatten it out. Start with some salt. Salt the inside of it. That's going to bring out some of the moisture while it's cooking. This we're going to do indirect on the big green egg. She's rocking around 225, and I believe we're going to do a, a pecan smoke on this once we've got the chips in there already. Pretty cool. Outside. We've got paste ground up here. Take a look at that. That is. Uh, Italian parsley, oregano, basil, garlic, and shallots in there. So that's that's what we're going to be stuffing it with. A nice paste. Yours went dark. Can you light it outside? Yeah, I just you did it. I didn't touch you did it from here. Tie it up tight. So when we roll it, make sure everything's tucked in on the ends, <clears throat> just like a burrito. Nice and tight. We got the butcher's twine. Take a nice long length. We'll do the same like we did to the porchetta earlier in class. Nice double knot out front. Seal it up. Now you pull it back. This one we're going to go about every inch because it's tight, small. Tie this however you want. This is just how I like to tie it. I find it's easier than doing a bunch of little knots, little loops. And the purpose of this not only is to hold the ingredients in. But it's also working like a cage to keep the formation of this meat the way it is so that when you slice it, it looks fantastic and however you're serving it, right? It holds its form. Now we'll double knot the end. There. 
just a little sprinkle of salt on the outside just to get it backed up. We want those juices to raise out of that meat just a little bit. So when the smoke hits it, sucks it back in. So this guy's super small. So we're going to go extra gentle with him. Get that silver skin off of there. Super important. That's I can't stress that enough. As many times as I've nicked my fingers, as many times as it sucked to have a sharp knife in the kitchen, it's it's the very first rule of fight club. You know what I mean? You want to get in there, you want a sharp knife to start with. It, it makes every process possible so much easier, especially with chicken, pork, and fish. These cuts are super important. If you mess something up here, the whole meal is pretty much toast, right? So, so this one we're actually going to do just a butterfly instead of instead of a whole a whole rollout. We're just going to slice it down the middle, open it up. The main one is showing us the red lines. Here, I'll show you. See. Okay, that's the above. I can't wait for you guys to try this. Really See, it's showing me the Like I said, because okay. there's a million different flavor yeah, how profiles. Do we get that out? So this is more of an Italian profile, but if you wanted like, like an Indian profile. That one's not doing it. it. Yeah. Uh, that one. Ginger. Yeah. That one. Ginger and shallots. You can spritz it in there instead of salt. There's a million different ways to do this. To make this work. Now we're from the beginning. One thing I'd like to do. Put that one down and just go mess with it. No, you're fine. Put it down. And it's fantastic. So that way you get the wrap, you get the infusion of all the flavors, and then you finish it off with a fresh, um, nice mix of some, some, some yogurt in there. It's It's incredible how far you can go with these recipes. And this simple process can be used for so many different things. Uh, you can do this with jerk, just like our, our jerk uh, uh, chili this morning. You can do this squash bonnets and mango on the inside with a jerk marinade on the outside. And this totally changes this up. It's, it's an absolutely wild canvas to, to cook virtually any flavor profile you want. There again, nice and tight. Turn this up. And then next up is Spash Talk. We've got our ribs going up there. I think they're getting pretty close. Then we've got to throw those uh, prime ribs on again. <laughs> so the prime ribs, we pulled them at 115. And we park them. Next will be a, a, a blazing finish. We're going to sear them off. Real hot, get a beautiful crust on them. So we did them with that, that steak seasoning. And it's, it's, we're it's all in it build up. I lost a little color on it. What's yeah. a little black or are you? Well, let me just see. Okay. <clears throat> if you're wondering why my butcher's twine is so long, it's because every time I cut it shorter, it's too short. So it's better to have a little extra than not enough. Should be better now. No, I took it off. That's what you guys think of those burgers. I took it off there. Oh, wow. 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 Well, honestly, that, that recipe that I've been in hand, with the pineapple, that uh, Kansas City bourbon, right, or the Kentucky bourbon, is it's my it's my go-to barbecue sauce. Like you, we had the uh, shrimp prawns this morning, right? It just it's so sweet, it's so flavorful, and it works on so many different things. I've marinated chicken breast with that. We stuffed chicken breast, just like I'm doing here with the pork tender ones. You can do the same thing with the chicken breast, or if you can get your hands on a turkey breast. A stuffed turkey breast is absolutely amazing, but you throw that that uh, Kentucky bourbon on there, it's, it's a game changer. So, yeah, I definitely suggest if you haven't tried that stuff yet, definitely get your hands on it because it is the flavor profile. It's sweet and savory. It does everything it needs to do. That's the color, too. Yeah. And another one, because I have kids, right? I've got, got a two-year-old and a seven-year-old. 
If you guys ever tried the Nashville hot rub that they have here, um, after they go to bed, when we're doing popcorn and movies in bed, right? You hit that Nashville hot chicken on, uh, on popcorn. It's, it's a great popcorn topper, so just, just so you know. Completely random use for it, but it works. So there we go. Those are ready to roll. Boom. Any questions about the fourth one? Since we're on that same page, don't be shy. What is the finishing temperature? So we're going to be cooking this to an internal 165. 165 for this because it's so thin, right? These are. These are very small. They're almost like a chicken breast. So we're, we're shooting for 165 internal there. It'll be perfect. You don't want to overcook these because they will literally dry out real quick, right? So they're going to go indirect, light smoke, and then you'll see. Champ, fantastic. Now, what temperature are you doing indirect at? Indirect, uh, 250, I believe, is what they're rocking on out there. You could even do them lower. You could do 225 if you want. A heavier smoke, right? So that's the trick with that. The 225 is the pocket for a heavy smoke. If you guys are looking to really pile that smoke in there, 225, that's the range where I hit everything. My briskets, my pork butts, whatever. I want them to have a good two, three hours in that window before I jack it up to finish. Even if you guys were doing a hot and fast pork butt, that extra hour at the beginning of piling that smoke in there at 225 is well worth it. Right, so 225, and then you bucket up to 350, rocket that thing up. You've got a, you've got a jet port butt, and you still get that ton of smoke up there to begin with. It's cold, it's taking it everything in, and that smoke kind of trades like crazy. So that's my, uh, my little tidbit for the 225. That's perfect. Salt. Chicken. So spatchcock chicken. For any of you that uh, have been on a big green egg for any kind of time, you, you will know by now that a roasted chicken on a big green egg is the best chicken you've ever had in your life. I don't care who you are, where you're from, if you've had a big green egg, roasted chicken, it is the juiciest, most tender chicken you've ever had. Even if you do it wrong, it's going to be better than most of the restaurants you eat that, so it is what it is, right? This fast cloud chicken we're going to do with the sweet and smoky alone. I'm going to take the spine out, crack it, open it up, season it on both sides, and it's going to go out there and gently smoke. I think you can. It might even be doing a hickory or something on that, but it's... One of the magic tricks with the big green egg is that it works like an oven. It stays humid inside because it's not moving a ton of air, like an offset smoker. You can literally see the amount of air flowing through, you can almost hear it, right? That's drawing moisture like crazy out of your proteins. With this, it's barely moving anything. It's just a small wisp of smoke, so all that humidity is staying inside of that egg. It, with chicken, this is absolutely essential. If you have a five piece expander, you have that top rack. You get this bird up into that top rack where all the heat is rolling out to get out the vent cap, it will crisp that skin up just perfectly, sucking just enough of that moisture out to finish the skin right where you want it. If you go to shut that temperature probe in the fire in the breast, when you pull it out, you'll notice it squirts. It literally squirts that beautiful juice out of it. That's how tender and juicy it is. I, I just, if, if there was ever something to sell your body on for a chicken, you know what I mean? Or for an egg, throw a chicken on. That's, Wife absolutely loves it. So what we do, we'll roast a whole bunch of chickens. We'll get them in a big bag from uh, from the local farmers market, and I'll roast them all. Spatchcock. We'll do a couple, and then we buck them up, throw them in sandwich bags for the week for salad, and that's it. Roast the chicken on a Caesar salad right now, like it's instant on wraps, whatever. It's just sitting in the fridge. So that's that's a, a huge part of our menu for our family is uh, spatchcock chicken. So this is this is gonna be easy. It's gonna be nice. If you haven't done it yet, spatchcock chicken is going to shave for an hour off the cook. 
So it, what it does is it opens it up so that they can cook on the inside a lot quicker than they can left the hole. Yeah, if you left it whole, check is going to take a couple hours. When you smash buck, you can get these guys done in like an hour, hour and a half. So it definitely helps it out. Holds all the moisture still in it. Rip cake stays intact, but broken through the, through the outside. I'll show you exactly how we do this. Beautiful little bird, right? Make sure the skin's pulled back. Everything's looking good. So here's the spine right there. Take a look on the screen there. You can grab the tail, open it up, make sure there's no bags in there. <laughs> and we'll break down that rip cage right close to the spine. These shears are amazing. Absolutely love these shears. And then we just run down those ribs on that side. Nice and clean. They have a safety on which I, <laughs> I love. And roll them over the other side. So this one has that little nub of the neck, right? Easy to hold on to. And another thing with this, I don't throw this spine out. I will throw them in a big freezer bag. I have a freezer bag full of spines. And what I do with them, <laughs> I have a freezer bag full of chicken spines. <laughs> that I saved uh, for when I'm making broth. I make broth for all kinds of stuff, but this is absolutely incredible if you have a bag full of these, you throw them in an instant pot or on the stove, whatever. The broth that you get from these is far better than if you use chicken feed or whatever. These are incredible. So whenever you're doing these, I, I strongly suggest throw a bag in the freezer, save it up. I'm a huge soup fan, right? It, it definitely helps. Homemade chicken noodle soup, from a jar of broth will literally change your life. It's like a hug in a jar. So we'll just tell them, don't throw them up. So we're going to take it. Did you hear that? Isn't that fantastic? Just flattens right out. So there we go. You give it a rub. Pull all that extra stuff out of there. Make sure it's nice and clean. And there we go. So this is sweet and smoky, is my go to for chicken. Head on the inside, don't be shy. Get it in there. Same deal, no binder. I see a lot of people using oil on chicken. How would you dare? Let me put it. Stop doing that right now. So, what it's, what it's going to do is it's going to block. It's going to block that charcoal flavor from getting inside of that bird. The only time I feel it's acceptable to use oil on this skin is when you have the color of the skin right where you want it. Then if you want to hit it with a quick spray of say dot fat or crisco, whatever you want, it's going to hold that color and it's going to lock that skin in. And it's not going to keep it rubber. That's the trick is that this is a crispy skin, a bite through skin, not really rubbery at all, you know. So, notice again, no binder, no foreign materials going into this. It's just the chicken and the rub. Get into all of them little crevasses. These are wrinkly little guys, so you got to get right in there. Don't be shy. The wings are my favorite part, so I always spend a bit of extra time on them. So if you guys remember Christmas vacation, there. Save me the neck, Clark. These guys. Look at that. So now, if, if we were going to put it on the grill, you pull those thighs up right to there. You tuck those tips into those thighs, and it's going to cook just the way we set it. And this is going to be absolutely amazing. So we'll let them run that out right there. Okay, now, yes. so what's, our, what's your settings for those? Now you've done that, you're going direct on the heat, what's the temperature, what's the time, all that? That's going to be indirect. Um, it's going to be indirect on that big green egg, and I'm thinking they're probably going to be 275 to 325. Chicken, you want a bit higher than pork. Um, 
It's going to render out a bit faster. It's going to cook a bit faster than pork. And we definitely want that skin to dry up. Like I said, we want that bit of air to be rolling around the top, but not hot enough that it's going to burn, right? Especially with rub any kind of sugar in there, it's going to want to burn. So we want to make sure it's right in that pocket where it's not going to overcook the skin and get it as high as you can. Just like if you're cooking pizza. Any of you familiar with cooking pizza on a big green egg? Yeah. Magic trick there if you have that expander, you're going to just getting it up top with the proper size of pizza uh, stone. The higher you go in that dome at the heat you're running at five, six, seven hundred degrees, that's where all of the air is moving on the outside of that lid coming up and right out the vent cap. So if you get that pizza right up inside of there, it's pulling all of the air, the bubbles and the humidity that it's spitting is sucking right through. You're not going to overburn your crust, and it's going to pull all the moisture off the top as it steams. You're going to end up with a nice, crispy, evenly cooked pizza in a very short amount of time. You get so. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely. The size of the grill is the size of the stone, right? So you're 14 inch, I think, or, or one one smaller, not depending on the size of your egg. You just fit it up. You'll you'll see what I mean. As long as you got inch circumference around it, it works perfectly. I know that you use salt on everything. No, so because it's already juicy, juicy, juicy. So I, I was already honestly. That's actually a great question, ladies and gentlemen. Have you guys met Team Canada yet? We have to have a celebrity. <laughs> she, she's my southern belle. I love her. I might go stay with her here in the night or two just to hang out for a bit. See what happens. Um, if I have time, and this is my culinary whatever coming out, if I have time, I will actually sprinkle that chicken the day before with salt over the skin and leave it open on a cookie drying sheet of drying in my in my fridge. And I will let it suck as much of that moisture as possible, dampening it with a, with a paper towel before I cook it. And then your skin is going to be the most perfect skin you've ever seen. Same as uh, uh, dry aging a steak really quick with a salt brine. It's the exact same process. You want to suck that moisture out and give it 24 hour and it works out perfectly. So that is a great question. This was quicker than that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you can. Can you explain? You got a couple you questions. questions. Do you ever have underneath the skin? Can you, get a you definitely can, and it does help. This is going to be so flavorful that we're, uh, one that I will do that with all the time is turkey. So turkey, I'll get under the skin with butter. I like to get butter all up in there whenever possible. That is one that I will inject as well. I will inject the turkey because turkeys are not fantastic unless you use some shenanigans. So I like to use shenanigans on the turkey as well. <laughs> yeah. I, I actually, I, the neatest recipe I've ever done with a turkey was I cooked scallops the day before in a ton of butter. And I saved the butter, turned it into compound butter, and then used a seafood compound butter into the turkey the next day, and the turkey tasted like scallops, like a garlic root <laughs> scallop. It was everyone's like, hey, yeah. this turkey I've ever had. I'm like, well, right, because it's, I guess it's a scallop. This is like, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Great job. Just a little, yeah. Yes, I have. I have. For these small chickens, I find it doesn't do a, a ton, um, unless you're going with a specific flavor profile. Um, these are just as easy to, to dry run as they are to wet run. But uh, turkeys, for sure, if you're doing a classically smoked turkey, you can wet run it. The trouble is the skin. You're always fighting that skin with being rubbery when you're done. Uh, for fun, I did last year a 39 pound turkey on my 2XL. Yeah, it was, the, it was the size of a small ostrich. And I did it straight up with a dry brine using a uh, cage of spice and just Himalayan big sea salt, and that skin was almost like cracker. It was, and it was like mahogany colored. It was absolutely perfect. And then I, I, I knew like I didn't need my grinding bucket anymore. I just feel like that. It was super easy. So that was a, a 12 hour dry grind in the fridge on a cooling rack. And it was super easy. And you could literally snap that skin. It was so perfect. So, you know, 39 pounds. Literally, it was like a beach ball. Mm -hmm. And the wife stared at me like, 
Like literally, that was it. There was no word. Like, How long did it take? She was on there for, I want to say, five, six hours. It wasn't as long as I thought. I thought it would take longer than that. But five, six hours was uh, and say 225, 250, finished off 275. Easy peasy. So that's one thing with all my recipes, my heat gauge will move because of that whole smoke process. I'll dip into the 225. 225 is not enough heat for me to really process or render any kind of fat. If you are doing, say, a pork butt at 225 the entire time with our process, the way we're going, you're looking at like a 10 or 12 hour cook. There's no reason why you can't bump that last half of the race up into the 325s and 350s and cut six hours off your day. So that's, that's the magic of it. At the end, you're thinking of it, as soon as you wrap it, it's like, well, it really doesn't matter where it is, what it's doing. There's no more smoke happening, there's no more moisture. So I bump that up again, my briskets and everything, just to tail them off, save me some time. Yeah. Favorite side of the chicken Favorite side of the chicken salad. Oh, is that right? Do you guys like Brussels sprouts? Yeah. Yeah, me either. They suck. So what we're gonna do? What we're gonna do is make some Brussels sprouts today. We're gonna change my life. And this is the neat thing. So the last time I was down in Texas, doing a big barbecue tour, I went to all the old places, went through Lockhart, did everything. I noticed that everyone, at this point in the game, everyone has nailed their briskets. Everyone has nailed their chicken. Everyone has nailed their turkey breast. Everyone has nailed their sausage. They're all cooking at the same level now. They're fighting you should be for science. They're bringing people in from hotels, culinary institutions. And making crazy sides. And this is where the game has now changed, is that the sides are, are so elevated. And the one thing that stopped me dead in my tracks, because I've never liked Brussels sprouts, and I always had to eat them. I was the kid that sat at the table until he fell asleep in his plate, because I was just a little fucker, right? And uh, Brussels sprouts were one of those ones. That was steamed spinach. No. Well, we've got to care to put water, you can put KFC in there. What we need is still gross, man. That's it. So, Brussels sprouts, I had a plate or a little little, little boat of uh, Brussels sprouts when I was at Tredium Distillery. And they sesame oil with a sesame uh, finishing of, of a salad dressing with seeds and everything cooked in bacon fat. And I say bacon fat very nicely because fat is flavor. So you guys understand we're all on the same page here. Bacon fat. And those damn Brussels sprouts changed my life. I ate more of them than I did the brisket that day. I'm telling you, I dug right into them. And everyone else was like, hey, where's those? Never mind. That's it. Like they were, they were mine. I, so that's what we're going to be doing here right away. Are they working on them now? Yeah. So that's what, that's what we're going to be getting into. Um, Okay, and we're searing off the prime rib. Yeah. Right on, right on. What else? What else we got going here? And ribs. Are they ready to pull yet? Probably. Pretty close. Okay. Okay. Awesome. So yeah, the the Brussels sprouts. Um, as soon as I saw my kids finish them, that was another one. Like kids are great judges of these kinds of, and I'm constantly testing whether it's like uh, a bacon-crusted mac and cheese, right, or you're doing some kind of crazy. Uh, uh, I did a, a poblano and mozzarella K, uh, um, craft dinner, and it was just like it, it changed the game. So now all of a sudden they have regular KD, and they're like, this is not going to – where's the other one? Like, what are you – so constantly, constantly changing my, my sides, constantly changing the way that I do things, but – these Brussels sprouts are going to be a game changer. I cannot wait. We're cooking them on the cast iron, I think 225, 250, no smoke. And they're going to be rolling out here right away. The ribs are done right away. Prime rib, I cannot wait for you guys to rip into that prime rib. That's, that's my favorite. It's my absolute favorite. And uh, yeah, you guys got any questions? Don't be shy. I love the walk. So... So I leave it wide open, right? Crank the vent wide open, red hot, um, coconut oil. I'll get funky. I'll get into the sesame oil and stuff like that. Most of the proteins I'll actually smoke ahead of time and then cut up into shredded or, or in, into strips 
and then I'll just finish them off in the oil as the, as the, uh, the noodles are going. Or if you're doing rice, rice is also fantastic. I did a, a, a chicken fried rice out of that wok that was like, it was a game changer. So that the wok is definitely, it's, it's an unused thing that a lot of people need to see. Um, they don't like me talking about it, but I've also done uh, uh, deep fried chicken. I've done Northern uh, uh, Nashville hot chicken in the wok and then used my other egg as an oven. So you fill it up with oil. Worst case scenario, if it did catch, you shut the lid. It's safe, no, it's, it's safer than it is in your kitchen. If you had a pot on the, on the stove and it caught, well, it's not that easy. Shut the lid, you're done. That's So yeah, probably not supposed to sell that one, but it is what it is. Deep, yeah, the wife hates me deep frying in the house, right? So it's it was just a, a natural progression to do. And how, how can you fight spicy chicken, right? Spicy chicken anytime is perfect. So yeah, I've done, I've done a ton with that. Okay. Also, turns out, Rob is pretending to read today, so if you guys can ask me any questions online, we're going to answer you. So let's do that, because no one else has any questions, apparently. I'm being too thorough today. That's what's happening. How many eggs do you have? Your, your, what's your personal setup look like? Oh, okay. so way up at my house, I have... Two XLs, an XL, my original 1994 large, and then I have the two XL, Eggzilla over here. And that's in, in my, my gauntlet, my, my cooking area, right? If you go on my YouTube, check it out. You'll see it all the time. I do a ton of stuff. And to be honest with you, I cook on at least one to two of them every single day. Every single day. We haven't used the stove for forever. So it's... Uh, it's a blessing and a curse, right? Because I don't like going in the house anymore. <laughs> it's really loud and annoying in there, so I just try and stay outside whenever possible. But uh, yeah, I, I really like uh, my outdoor kitchen. It's it's a great place to do stuff, and and I yeah, every day I'm on the eggs, love it. So for desserts, the best one I ever did was a lightly smoked banana bread loaf that was stuffed with Reese's Pieces. <laughs> and then cut, yeah. And then I took, right before it tacked up, I took four big Reese's cups and stuffed it in the top and then covered it in peanut butter and then finished it off at 500 so that it crisped up on the outside. <laughs> yeah, no, trust me, it was it was insane. So I, I don't actually eat sweets myself. I'm, I'm just a weird, it is what it is, but... Uh, whenever I do cook, um, we, we've, we've baked pies on there, right? Um, the first time I saw a pecan pie cooked was at Big Green Eggs Eggtoberfest in 2018, and we had Smokey Poet at the time. He did a pecan pie that just changed my life. So when we get a chance to do those, and I, actually my grandmother's still alive. She's 96 years old, and every once in a while she'll come over and she'll bring a raw pie, and we'll bake it in there just to get that whole thing it's it's a lot of a lot of fun but i i try not to put too many desserts in there because then that's what everyone's going to want all the time so what? um so that that uh banana bread i did i did a light smoke and pecan on that and that was nice another thing that i do like to smoke whenever possible is water to turn into ice for my old fashions right so yeah getting into that kind of stuff also if you want to dry out uh grapefruit it's fantastic to get a bit of smoke on your grapefruit for a garnish for your old fashions or whatever cocktail you're making. So you can get creative in there. Um, you can also smoke nuts. That's that's a good that's a good one for Christmas especially, right? Um, and uh, the kids, nuts and bolts, right? You do the. We got a question. No, well, online we do. But okay. Finish your question. Yeah. So yeah, we do we do the the nuts and bolts, the shreddies, and then the Cheerios and everything. You can season them up with a bit of Cajun or whatever, right? And you can throw a little bit of smoke on there. Kids love it. So. Okay, one, Jeff Dez says hello from Canada. Hey, Dez. How you doing, brother? And then Les has a question. It's, uh, what is your favorite appetizer? My, my favorite appetizer. Ooh, that's a tough one. Honestly, if I had to break it down, I really love um, up where I'm at, what do we call it? 
broccolini. I don't know what you got. It's a baby broccoli. It's still very, very green, very... You do a live fire, right? Wide open, you're rocking at 500 degrees, a bit of garlic, olive oil, and a bit of sprinkle of, of course, salt and pepper, and then flash that over the fire, and the flames lick as the oil hits. And it's such gentle uh, leaves, you just quickly... And you get that flame kiss on it and then throw it on there as well as asparagus. Asparagus is also a nice, nice one to do like that. And uh, yeah, that's my flame kissed veggies, especially next to a, a steak. Incredible. Okay, next question is what's your favorite pizza setup for a group? Oh, so that would be you're shopping for pizza pans. <laughs> that's your go to is to find a nice perforated pizza pan that you can get five or six of, lay your dough out in that pizza pan, prep it however you do the cornmeal or whatever, set your pizzas up, have them all built, and then just rocket them one after the other. We've cooked 40 pizzas at a time like that. One after the other, they're a good three to five minutes each, click, 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 and away you go. Depends how many pizzas you have to do, but you can definitely do one top rack, one small, one bottom rack if you have different size pizza pans. So that's another, that's another way to do it. So pork butts, I'm going to smoke them at 225 to start out. They're heavily rubbed. They're sitting there. They're collecting their smoke. And when the fat starts to drip, you know you're around 125, 150. That's when I want to either put them in a pan or start the process of wrapping them. So I'll set up a boat set them up inside of the boat and then the boat's going to end up being sealed up and finished up as soon as i go to seal it up and finish it up we're done with the smoke that's when we start 300 325 350 depending on what i'm doing and why i need to be done early right it's it's wide open from there if i got all night i'll stay at 300 325 if i need them done right away you can even walk them up to 375 after they're wrapped and you can tur turbo them right so it's 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 wide open like i said most of this is about the temperature of the meat and knowing you're not going to burn it and whatever it is you have to do the reasons why you have to speed things up but it's it's pretty wide open as long as you're following the, the temperature hey, yes yes so funny you bring that one in ladies and gentlemen mel has done a collaboration with heartbeat hot sauce it's a big company out in Thunder Bay, Ontario, and they're absolutely amazing. They started out of the garage. You guys might have seen them on Hot Ones. So the, the TV show with the celebrities eating the hot wings and stuff, they've been on like half of those seasons. They're uh, deadly, deadly hot sauce. Their only other collaboration is Dustin Poirier. He's a UFC fighter. Their second one was me. So I'm absolutely blessed to be tied in with them. And everybody's got one on their table. Make sure when we're having dinner, you guys have a splash, take a taste of it. I believe it's going to be available on Amazon down here right away. It's also on their website, Heartbeat Hot Sauce. They have a link to it, and they'll ship it out here right away. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, this was actually a brainchild of mine. It's the base of hot pot soup. If you guys are at all familiar with hot pot soup, I'm constantly barbecuing. Every single day I'm cooking beef ribs or brisket or whatever. And sometimes, believe it or not, it gets a bit heavy. So from time to time, I'll have a soup going in the corner and that's what I'll be eating. I'll be eating shrimp or chicken or veggies out of that. And one day I had to eat this beef rib for the camera and I was just, I was not into it. I was, I knew that it was fantastic, but I knew I just, I just was not into it. And I had that broth sitting there and I was like, you know what? And I took a bite of that and it totally changed that beef rib. And this is why I say to everybody with whatever ingredients you're cooking with, whatever, don't be stuck in that box of, okay, they stuffed this chicken breast with this. So this is what you have to do. If you're thinking Indian tonight, put curry in that chicken breast. Don't be shy to do it. There's no reason why you can't. You can literally infuse anything with anything and turn it into something new. And that's what I'm constantly doing, just like this hot sauce. It's a hot pot based Sich Sichuan shiitake that you put on a brisket, a fresh brisket, and it changes that brisket completely, but it's still fantastic. So that's, I push that with everything, just like the porchetta. I've seen porchetta done Italian. I've seen porchetta done Indian. I've seen porchetta done like a Mexican. It's fantastic. 
It's totally different, totally neat, and it's totally wide open to you and your guys' flavor profile, whatever you guys want to do. So, yes, sir. Yes. Yes. But you want it to burn a bit. Yeah. Because if you're serving a paella that doesn't have that quarter inch of crust in the bottom, you didn't have a paella. <laughs> so there is that. You do want that crust at the bottom. Don't be shy with that. A good paella, if you Google it, a good paella has a quarter inch of crust at the bottom, and that's what everyone is shooting for. Um, we, we have a few people maybe in the audience that have eaten paella and will know that you need that crust at the bottom for a proper paella. So don't be shy. If you're getting that crust, there's a reason you got it. You did it right. <laughs> yeah, no problem. But it, other than that, it's either putting a secondary plate setter in there. Um, sometimes when I have really delicate cooks, like I did a beef wellington, and I had to make sure that she didn't cook heavier on the bottom than she did on the top, I put a pizza stone over top of my plate setter and I used four uh, half inch nuts. And I put the half inch nuts around and I set that pizza stone on top of it. I let everything come to temperature and it worked almost like a radiator so that it wasn't nearly as hot emitting from that secondary pizza stone so that that uh, beef wellington cooked completely evenly. Sometimes we have to do this sort of stuff depending on what you're cooking on, but now you're going down the culinary rabbit hole and it gets real crazy so <laughs> no problem I'm glad you asked that so chicken wings is one of my absolute favorites I love chicken wings I do a play on the old Hooters wings where I'll I'll cook them up they're a light dusting of granulated garlic you're gonna use like Frank's red hot with butter cook it down in a saute pan you're going to smoke them off just, just nice, straight over the charcoal, and then you're going to baste them or put them right in the pot, spin them up, throw them back on. You want to do that three times before you finish them off. And the third time, if you can get them direct instead of indirect to get that kiss of charcoal and that little bit of char on those chicken wings, they're going to pop like you wouldn't believe. And if you guys are using a marinade on your, on your chicken wings, let them dry out for a couple of hours before you throw them on the grill. So one I do, I do a, a, a dill pickle chicken wing where I'll, I'll literally take a jar of dill pickles and I'll dump it into a bag with chicken wings, let them sit overnight or 24 hours in that pickle brine. And then I take them out and set them up on a rack in my fridge and I'll let them sit for about eight hours before I cook them. That way you still get the crispy skin, but they're totally infused in that pickle brine. So. That's, that's my magic trick there. And don't be afraid to double back at the end and hit it with more sauce, right? So if you have to reduce that pickle brine a bit with a hot sauce to get that back in there, it's, it's really doable. There you go. Perfect. Online, it is uh, Kevin. Oh, there you go. Uh, have you cooked Wagyu and what temperature are you cooking? Uh, Okay, Wagyu steak, you're going to want to cook that. Um, depending how thick, you're probably going to want to go hot and fast with Wagyu. If, if it's like a New York strip or something like that, you're going to want to go real hot and fast. The trick with Wagyu is you don't want to be grabbing it with tongs and pulling it apart because the grains are going to open up and all that fat is going to leak out. You want to keep it nice and tight, use a spatula and probably a set of tongs to stop it on the other side so you're pushing it together more than anything while you go to flip it. That's, that's my biggest piece of advice for uh, Wagyu is uh, keeping it tight, not pulling it apart. Hot and fast is my thing to do with that. And definitely do a dry salt brine a couple hours. Goes a, a ton, a ton with those. Uh, the other one was, you mentioned you had kids. What is a good appetizer to put kids on the big green So the one that kids go absolutely crazy is for spider dogs. You take a hot dog and you... you leave a half inch in the middle, totally intact, and then you take a knife on both ends, straight out, roll it over, and then straight out again, so you got quarter cuts on both sides of that hot dog, leaving that half inch in the middle, and when you grill them off, the sides turn into little spiders, and the kids go absolutely crazy over them, and they also crunch up a bit. So if adults were eating them, you could hit them with a rub. Just saying, real quick, hit them with a rub, roll them around, they're fantastic. 
So, yeah. I do so. I do so. I cold smoke cheese. So you get a, a tiny little um, chip box or something, pull everything out of your egg, set it up at the very bottom, and then make sure with a temperature probe. And this is the biggest part. Probe that temperature with that thing running to make sure your temperature outside and everything is good before adding the cheese. If you're good, then slowly cold smoke. If you're doing fish or any type of meat, make sure you're staying with uh, the recipes of the brines, right? Because it's very easy for stuff to go off with cold smoke if you're not using the proper chemicals and stuff to, to dry, dry salt, cold smoke. Yeah. I have, I have so. It, um, it, it's tasty, it doesn't work so well for me just because it's a lot of, lot of heat to get it going and do whatever it is it, it needs to do. And usually if I have a steak that's nice enough that I would want to use it, I've already dry brined that steak, so it's the same thing anyway. But, but they are totally doable and they're fun to use. They're really fun to use. So yeah, it, it's for sure in the wheelhouse. Do you have any tips on smoked cocktails? Smoked cocktails. So um, bring a piece of charcoal in right? Say it's Christmas. Christmas, family's around, whatever. You got the egg rocking. Take your tongs, bring a piece of charcoal in. So you got a, a, a piece of wood that you're going to be using to smoke right in the kitchen. Set that piece of charcoal on that wood cocktail glass over. Let it burn right there. Flip it over and away you go. If not, then take your water, smoke your water, smoke it down to about half fill it up again, smoke it down again to half, and then throw it in the freezer in ice cube trays, and remember your ice cube tray. That's the key. Now you have an ice cube tray that's only for that, so that's the key. Remember that tray, but that's the other way, the smoke in your ice ahead of time. So, yeah. Yeah, smoke, smoke cocktails are a big, big thing for me. I really like uh, my old fashions, so I'm always trying to do stuff. But yeah, bringing that one piece of red hot charcoal in, that's the easiest, is just bing, bang, boom. So don't you dare read that one. No, Look at you giggling over there. I can't read that one. Yeah, it's, yeah that's, I know those people. Yeah, yeah. What's your favorite exotic meat to grill, um, ostrich, alligator, shark, etc. Like My favorite, like, chaos cook? is still the alligator. It's still the alligator. To me, a, a properly cooked whole alligator head on is gnarly. Everyone walking past it is going to be like, what the heck are you doing? And it also tastes fantastic. It tastes a little bit like chicken. It takes the rub in really crazy. Uh, the last crazy one we did, we used a, a really high quality kettle cooked apple cider vinegar. And it took that in with the rub. Actually, it was fantastic. It was really good. So Alligator is my big one, but my showstopper usually is my octopus. That's my, that's my go-to. We cooked an octopus on the deck there yesterday out back, and it, it was really good. A lot of people, they're, they're not familiar with it, so don't be shy. Try octopus because it's really good. When you flame finish it, it's, it's well worth the effort. So. We'll go ahead and wrap up. Tell the uh, guys on the internet how they can find you, how to follow you, all that great stuff. Thank you guys very much for tuning in online. It's always good to see you again. Make sure you follow me. My name is Mel Schmiller, Dark Side of the Grill. Google me, Dark Side of the Grill. Check me out on Instagram, Dark Side of the Grill. TikTok, Dark Side of the Grill. I'm on YouTube, Dark Side of the Grill, and also have a Facebook, Dark Side of the Grill. And it's me, Dark Side of the Grill. So thank you guys very much for tuning in. This has been an amazing time. And uh, you snuck in here for free, so lucky you. All right. Place where fire and flavor are celebrated. Grill it, roast it, smoke it, or bake it. It's the most versatile grill you'll ever own. Have it delivered to your door by a certified dealer in your community and start enjoying the ultimate cooking experience. Visit BigGreenEgg.com.